between crescent and cross, the Jewish experience under Christianity and under Islam. Last week we, went, we talked about the birth of Christianity and the birth of Islam and the differences and how they pertain to the Jewish people. Tonight I just want to go back just a little bit in time because we did actually get into the period of what we call the Golden Age of Spain with the fellows like Chazda ibn Shaprut, Reb Shmuel Hanagid, the Jews under the caliphs at, those, at that time were very successful. They rose to great prominence. They acted as statesmen, as politicians, as governors, everything except numero uno. They always had this level with underneath the, the, the Muslim regime of being dhimis, second-class citizens. But, you know, I mean, listen, second-class citizens is better than being persecuted, tortured, and exiled. So they lived there, and they prospered, and they did good business, and they kept going. This was, of course, at the expense, the rise in Spain was at the expense of the community back east in Babylon. Because if you remember, the community back east in Babylon for close to a thousand years had prominence over all of Jewry. I mean, that's where it says, Kimitzi and Tetzay Torah, that from the verses, from here shall the Torah go forward, it doesn't mean anymore from Jerusalem. And it didn't mean from Tel Aviv or from, or from Haifa. It meant from Baghdad. Baghdad was the center of all, of all Torah scholarship. And this was going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And basically the political structure, as we talked about last week a little bit, was that there was a separation of powers between the Reish Galuse, or the Exilarch, who was the political uh, leader. He took care of all of the politics of the community and the infrastructure of the community, the, the money of the community. And there was two great yeshivas, Sura and Pompedisa, each of these yeshivot, these places of study, had what we called a gaon, a, a head of the yeshiva, and between the three of them, or between the two of them, you know, depending upon how many there were at any specific time, they basically ran the community. The Reish Kalusa, the exilarch, as I mentioned last week to you, and this is very important to remember, was a skion, or a scion, of the house of David. He had to be, literally, he had to be able to trace back his lineage to King David because he was purported to be the Mashiach. If Mashiach was going to come, it was going to be the Resh Kalus. He had a tremendous amount of power. I mean, I just looked up today in, the, in Maimonides, Maimonides, if you, in, in, the, in the laws of Sanhedrin, the laws dealing with the, the high court. What we're going to do is one second, because it's a little bit warm in here, so just to talk among yourselves, I'm a little verklempt, you know. You know. Okay, sorry, but if I'm sweating, you're definitely sweating out there. Okay, so they read the Resh Kalusa and actually powers of appointing the Gaon. He was the one that said, you, yeah, you, not, you, yeah, you, not. So he had a tremendous amount of power. But so did the Gaon, because the Gaon actually was the head of the yeshiva. So under him, he was the head of all of the, uh, the court system, because he appointed all the rabbis in various places. And, uh, you know, when, when, when you're the head of the Supreme Court, you have certain powers. So tonight we want to focus on one of the Gaonim, because there was at least a hundred Gaonim that went through from the time the Jews moved out to Babylon until the end, we'll call it the year 1000, there was about a hundred Gaonim that reigned. Many of them very famous, Rav Shiri, Rav Haigon, but the most famous and the most interesting by far is a fellow by the name of Rav Sadia Gaon. Rav Sadia Gaon was, a, was by, na- by birth an Egyptian, he was born in Egypt. And as a young man, he was very scholarly, he was a great Talmud Chochem, studied the Talmud and studied all many other things, and decided that, you know what, if you really want to know and you really want to learn, you've got to go to where the, the, the yeshivas are. So he moved west to Babylon, he came to Babylon. A student, he was there, well, a, well, a good student, and he rose to prominence because of a controversy. What was the controversy? In the year... 921, a controversy broke out between the rabbis of Babylon and the rabbis of Israel. What was, what was the controversy? What day Rosh Hashanah was going to be? The rabbis in Israel established Rosh Hashanah on Wednesday, and the rabbis in Babylon established the, 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 uh, the Rosh Hashanah on Tuesday. And, and what happened was, is that the rabbis in Israel wrote a letter to the yeshivas in Babylon saying that it has been a custom for close to 2,000 years since the Jews went into Israel, that the only ones that were allowed to establish a date in the calendar 
were only the rabbis of Israel. This has been, this has been what we call a tradition of Kabbalah, that when Moses set up the Sanhedrin back in the desert and they moved into Israel, the Sanhedrin in Israel were the only ones that had a right to establish the new moon. Because how did we run a calendar? This is way before you got your calendar from Mount Sinai Cemetery. Right? I mean, this, they weren't printing calendars yet from any cemetery. There was no calendars whatsoever. So how did you know when Rosh Chodesh was? When did you know when the new moon was? When did you know when Sukkot? Only the Sanhedrin established it. You looked out, they said, oh, there's a new moon. We call it today day one of the month. And only the rabbis in Israel, and clearly stated among all the codifiers, that even if the greatest rabbi who lived outside the parameters and the boundaries of Israel had no right to, to have any opinion concerning the calendar. This was our. So even though the rabbis understood that the great scholars were living in Babylon, but certain rights were still kept in Israel. So they wrote this treatise, and they sent it to the rabbis in the Gaonim in, in Baghdad. They turned around and they said, okay, who's going to answer this? So in 921, Reb Sad Yagon rose up, the Egyptian, and he wrote a great letter, maybe more than one, maybe a five-page letter, disclaiming everything that the rabbis in Israel said, and showed that it wasn't in their right, and this was right, and it couldn't be Tuesday, it had to be, or whatever it was, it wasn't Wednesday, it had to be Tuesday, back and forth, and he won the battle. When he won the battle, oh, all of a sudden there's a new star in town, Reb Sad Yagon. Now, Reb Sad Yagon was a very interesting guy, because he was also not only a great scholar, but had a very tough personality. Tough meaning that he was, uh, you know, I mean, he believed in what he believed in, and he wouldn't budge. He was a stubborn guy. At the same time, the Resh Galusa was a fellow by the name of Joseph Ben Zakai, who was also happened to be a very stubborn guy. So when Reb Sad Yagon was, appo was appointed to, to the Goan ship, you knew that it wasn't going to be for long, but before, there was going to be fireworks in Baghdad. You just knew it. And what happened? Kachava. There was a will. And the will came to the Resh Galusa. And he signed off that this is a will that could be collected by the family. It's fine. It came to the desk of Rapsad Yagon, who also had to sign off. He refused to sign it. He said there was controversy, there was problems in the will. The way it was written, he wasn't going to sign it. <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to sign it? So the, the Resh Kalusa, the ex-lorik, says, well, I signed off and I want this will to be executed. He said, no, the will will not be executed because there's problems in the will and it can't go as, as, as it stands right now. Well, now what you have is a force of two very stubborn people. And neither one would give an inch. Neither one would give an inch. And as they tried to resolve it, so sometimes, you know, you call the parties in, you sit down, you make nice, you give a little, you give a little, and everybody gets along, not with these two. As time went on, not only did the fight not subside, it intensified. It intensified to the point that both of them appointed different people to substitute for the other guy. So, Reb, so Joseph ben Zaki appointed a different Goan and didn't recognize the Goan ship of Reb Sadia Goan. So Reb Sadia Goan turned around and he appointed a new Resh Kalusa. He appointed a new Exilarch to be, to, for five years, for five years, there was absolutely no communication between, and the community was ripped in half, completely torn in half. Then they went, they made a mistake. And this is a mistake that's repeated many times in Jewish history, and we have to learn from this, that Joseph ben Zakkai went to the political leadership at the time, to the caliph, and he squealed on Sad Yagon, thinking, ah, you know, if the caliph comes on my side, and he's, of course, a Muslim, and he's going to side with me, we'll finally get rid of this, this Egyptian. No. All the caliph did was milk them for taxes. He said, ah, oh, we got two Resh Kalusas and two Goinim. <laughs> Look at that, so now I could collect from both of them. So he played one side against the other. It was in his best interest to keep everybody, uh, uh, what do they call it, divide and conquer. No problem. I saw there's a, there's a great history set by uh, Heinrich Graz. I mean, if you're interested in reading these big tombs of history like this, you know, you could buy his history. And he writes in this period, it got so bad, it got so bad that one time there was a dispute with Joseph ben Zakai's son. Now in a normal dispute, if we have a dispute among ourselves as Jews, how do we resolve it? What do we do? We go to a? Civil. Bestin. No, you don't go to civil court. You go to a Beth Din. 
You go to a Jewish court. How is this court decided? So how are we going to do it? So let's take, for example, myself and Marvin have a dispute. So what are we going to do? So there's no court here in Long Beach. You, you know there's a Besden here in Long Beach? No. So what we call it's called Zablo. Zablo means I choose a rabbi and Marvin chooses a rabbi. And these two rabbis choose a third rabbi. Mm. And that's how the court is made. Okay? Zeb Beider, I pick, you pick one, and these two pick a third one. Okay? That's, that's in, in case where there's no standing Besden, that's what we do. Okay? So here they sat down and there was a dispute with uh, David ben Zakai's son and someone else. The other party said, when, they, when, he, when, he, when he was asked, okay, who's going to be your rabbi? This guy thought he's going to be smart. He says, I'm taking Sad Yagon. When Joseph ben Zakai's son just heard the name, he jumped over the table and pummeled the guy. Just for mentioning Sad Yagon's name, not even taking him as the rabbi. He literally, he says, jumped over the table and a fight ensued on the floor where he was pummeling the other guy with his fists. <laughs> this is the level of what happened of, of, of this guy. Finally, you know what? The community got so sick of the politics, it called them both together and it said, listen, we can't take this anymore. You got to make peace. So they laid down their arms and they said, okay, you know what? It's peaceful. And the irony is, is that the grandchildren of, 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 of David ben Zakkai was raised in the house of, of Reb Sad Yagon. He raised the grandchildren because his son had passed away. He left some grandchildren. He raised them up as his own children. This is talking about, uh, about 930 in the year 930-935 of, of, the, of the common era. The one thing, there's many things that, that, that Sadiqon instituted that we have, but one of the great things that he encountered was that at this particular time, I'd mentioned last week, that the Muslims were very, very much into scholarship. They had, they had philosophers, they had poets, they had musicians. They were into culture. They loved Arabic culture, was flourishing. And certainly in Baghdad, at the time it was flourishing. What was the problem? Since Judaism never really had a dogma, no one had ever written before any philosophy about Judaism. We have tombs and tombs and tombs of legal works. That is coming out of our ears. That we have so much. The Talmud has 20 volumes. We have responsa hundreds and thousands of books, but no one ever sat down to write, what do Jews believe? What do you mean, what do we believe? We believe in one God, Shema Yisrael, that's enough. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? There's, there's no dogma in Judaism. Well, Muslims had dogma. Muslims had what we believe in, how, what, how God works in the world, all of these things, and this was kind of infiltrating and influencing the Jewish community. So Reb Sadiqan was the first one after him, many, of, many great rabbis wrote on, on, on philosophy. But he sat down and he wrote the Sefer Amun Videos, the book of Jewish opinions and beliefs, of exactly what Jews believe. What is the makeup of God? What is our purpose in the world? What, what about the soul? Is it immortal? What happens after we die? All of these questions that were being answered by, by Muslim philosophers, Sadiqon sat down and wrote. Now, See, we sit back here in the 21st century and we think to ourselves, a big deal, you know, you go to a library now, you know how many Jew books on Jewish philosophy you have? Hundreds of books on Jewish philosophy. But it takes one giant, one giant to break through because no one had ever done this before. No one, it didn't come without great controversy. I mean, you think about it, that people were saying, what are you talking about? We're, we're, we're into philosophy? We're going to start now debating, debating the Muslims on philosophy? It's not for us. It is for us. Because the time has come now to make a stand. And this was, this was Reb Sad Yagon, A tremendous breakthrough. So among everything else which he left us, the first sitter that he put together, and many other great works of responses in Jewish law, he left us the idea that we can, in the marketplace of ideas, out there on the street, at 2nd and PCH, we could stand there together with everybody else and argue very poignantly about the supremacy of Jewish philosophy over everybody else. On his shoulders, who, who stands on his shoulders? Who? Maimonides. So Maimonides, later on when he writes the book of uh, this, the, 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 the Guide for the Perplex, wrote it with the same idea that Reb Sadia Gon had written several hundred years before him, 300 years before. And the same thing is true about Reb Yehuda Halevi, when he wrote the book of the Kuzari, and of Rabbi Joseph Kalbo, when he book, wrote the book of Sefer Ikrim, and, and Chestai Kreskis, another great medieval philosopher, 
They all came afterwards and they all based their writings upon this one book, Sefer Amun Nevideus, the book of Jewish belief and opinions. It was a major, major breakthrough. But I just wanted to bring this out because you see how the outside world, see we think sometimes we live in a vacuum. You know, Jews live in a vacuum and if you move to Bora Park, you close your windows and your shades, nothing is going to affect you. It doesn't work that way. There's the old expression, the Christel Zach Yidl Zach. The way the Christian world works, the same way the Jewish world works. And the greater the scholarship on the outside world is going to be the greater the scholarship on the, in the Jewish world. There are, certain, there are certain exceptions to the rule, such as Poland and Lithuania, which didn't produce such great Polish and Lithuanian secular scholars, but it did produce great Jewish scholars. But that's for a different topic for another day. But generally, in a milieu of philosophy and of culture, Jews are going to rise to that. If, it's, if, if not, then they're not going to. That's the way it is. At this period, it was great. A lot of philosophical writings were coming out. Ultimately, Reb Sadia Gon had sent these. We talked about last week about the four, the four fellows, the four rabbis that went and they disappeared. And so did the yeshiva in Surah. And now the Jews now came to Spain. In Spain, we talked about how the Jews were getting along with the Berbers and the Moors. And they were doing just fine. This was called, again, to reiterate, the golden age of Spain. Until came along a band called the Almohads. The Almohads, would, we can relate to them today. Why? Because these were fundamentalist Muslims. They were not into the same kind of philosophy and culture the Moors and the Berbers were. They were already, it's my way or it's the highway. That's the way it goes. Now the Jews living in Spain had gotten already used to being Spanish. I mean, they sat there, they spoke, they spoke Arabic, they wrote in Arabic, they, they, they thought of themselves as good citizens. Demis, nonetheless, but that doesn't make a difference. And we had now a whole period of great scholarship. Rabbi Yitzchak al -Fassi. just to give you one example, if you take a Talmud, if you take a book of the Talmud, you look in the back, he was the first codifier. The first one to codify Jewish law was Rabbi Yitzchak al -Fassi. What was the great idea of, of codification of Jewish law? Because, if you know how Jewish law is written, it was written like this. Scratching your ear this way. Why do I mean? Where was Jewish law primarily uh, spoken about? The Talmud. Okay? Now, I ask you a question. I come home on a Shabbos, and my wife... Now, are you allowed to cook on Shabbos? No. You can't cook on Shabbos. It's prohibited to cooking on Shabbos. Okay? But I open up the refrigerator and I see a kugel. Ooh, a piece of lakshin kugel, my favorite. Too much of my favorite, I have to, I have to admit. But now, I don't, like, I don't like cold lakshin kugel, I'll be honest with you. I like a little warm lakshin kugel. So I got a fire, and I got the cold kugel. I know that you can't cook, but it's cooked already. Can I warm it up? Oh, so I have to start thinking now, okay, where am I going to look up? Where am I going to look up warming up the kugel? So I got to go to a tractate in the Talmud. I take out the tractate called Shabbos, a big fat tractate about this. And I got to start remembering, okay, which section talked about heating up the Kegel? Of course, that's Kegel if you're from Hungary. Kugel if you're from Lithuania. <laughs> All right, so it's, that's a difference. So I'm thinking, was it page 27 or was it 72? I knew I shouldn't have fallen asleep during that lecture. Oh my gosh. So now I have to start leafing through all of the pages to find the portion that deals with Kira. To deal with the thing that what, can, what you could warm up. Then I got to, okay, I finally found a section. Now I got to find the exact place. So I find the exact place, and my luck, Rabbi Lazar says once, and Rabbi Yeshua says something else. He says yes, he says no, I, what am I going to do? By the time I get the answer, guess what? It's already nice Shabbos anymore, and I heat up the kogel. Forget about it. Shabbos has ended. This was a tremendous problem, so you had to, you had to really rely on a rabbi who really knew the Talmud well in the back of his hand. Okay? So what Rabbi Yitzhak al -Fassi did was, says, you know what? There's a lot of things going on in the Talmud that we don't need to know. So he rewrote the Talmud, taking out all of the stories, all of the legends, all of the, the stuff that was not particular to jurisprudence. All the unnecessary stuff that he felt. So from this big book, it came to this big book. So it was a start. A very good start, but still not perfect, because you still had to read through the whole Yitzhak al -Fassi to find exactly the part on warming up. Came along his student, who was called the Rimegash and refined it. And then the Rimegash student revolutionized Judaism forever. And who was the Rimegash student? Someone that came 
If you go now to Tiberius, you look at it, he's buried in Tiberius. You look at his gravestone and his name is Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. He's well known to us as Rambam. To the world he's known as Maimonides. And he was born in the year 1135 in Cordoba, Spain. To a rabbi, his father was a Rabbi Maimon, who was one of the leading uh, Dayanim, who was one of the leading judges in Cordoba. And this young man was born there. In the beginning, he wasn't a great student. His father even referred to him, I saw some biographies of him, referred to him as the butcher. You're going to grow up to be a butcher. That's what he told him. If you don't get serious, you're going to grow up to be a butcher. Okay, he's going to grow up to be a butcher. What could he do? So he decides he's going to send him away. He's going to send him to the Rimagash. The Rimagash lived in, 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 in Spain, in another town, and he sent him to be a student of this rabbi, the Megash. At 18, he returned home. And as he returned home, as was the custom in those days, the rabbi of the shul honored him with giving the sermon on Shabbos. His father was sitting in the front and his heart was beating like this because he didn't know, you know, it wasn't like we have emails today, you know, you can email what you're studying. To him, it, he, was a, he was still a, a mystery. He didn't know what was he was going to be listening to. So at 18 years old, the Rambam gets up there and his father's sitting in the first row. He's probably sweating like we're sweating tonight. He doesn't want to be embarrassed because he called him the butcher, you know, all of that. And he began to deliver a sermon on exactly the same topic that he wrote about many years before Rapsad Yagon, and that's on calculation of the calendar. Now, if you ever dealt with calculations of the calendar, it is one of the most difficult parts in the entire Talmud. You've got to be a well-known student of astronomy, of geometry, mathematics. I mean, you have to know everything, the degrees, where the sun and the pointing, this and that. I mean, astrophysics, basically. This is what, the, this is what you're studying here. And the Rambam, for two hours, got up there at 18 years old and delivered a sermon that probably no one in the shul understood. <laughs> maybe one guy understood it. Now, maybe one guy understood. It reminds me of the story of this great scholar that came to the shul, and a fellow was sitting in the front row, and he delivered this unbelievable talk about, in the Talmud, very deep and scholarly. And the fellow in the first row raises his hand, he says, yeah. And the fellow in the first row says, Lamai nafkimin. In, in the Talmudic terminology, this means, what's the difference? Who? Oh, what's the difference? So for another half an hour, again, he goes deeper in the sermon. Finishes half an hour, and this fellow raises his hand again. He says, Lamai nafkimin. What's the difference? So he goes again, and he's still deeper and more explanations are back. Finishes, and the fellow again picks up his hand, and he says, Lamai nafkimin. So at this point, where he was exasperated, the rabbi, and he said, what do you mean, Lamai nafkimin? What do you mean, what's the difference? So the guy says, what's the difference if you're talking to me or the donkey outside? There's no difference. I don't understand the first part. I don't understand the second part. What are you talking about? What are you getting so excited up there for? This was probably the reaction to the Rambam at 18 years old. But they already saw that he was so head and shoulders above everybody else. But at that time, he began to write. And he, he ended up leaving us five monumental works that haven't been seen since. Literally five monumental works. And how he wrote was, sometimes he wrote in Arabic, sometimes he wrote in Hebrew. Went back and forth and back and forth. At the time that he was rising up in scholarship, and he married, the Almohads took over. The Almohads. And the Almohads were fundamentalists that wouldn't allow Jews to live anymore as Jews. Because they only believed in one way. And only salvation could come through being a Muslim. Fundamentalist, jihad. So you're either with us, or you're against us. So the Jewish community, which lived so prosperous for so many years, all of a sudden is now faced with a situation they had to go underground, literally underground. The Rambam and his family left. They said, you know what, what do we need this headache for? Now, here's an interesting point I've seen some places. There are historians that argue at this point which to me is complete narishkeit, by the way, I just want to give this as, as this introduction, it's complete foolishness, is that the Rambam himself converted to Islam. What's the proof? The proof is where he went. He ran from Spain and he went to Morocco. Okay, he ran to Morocco. Where did the Almohads come from? Morocco. Because they rode up across the channel and ran in, came into Spain. So the argument goes something like this, okay? If you happen to be living in Hungary in 1947, let's just give an example, and you happen to be an anti-communist rabble rouser, and okay, and you were exiled, where would you go? Oh, where would you go? You're an anti-communist rabble rouser. The one place you don't go is to Moscow. 
right? You don't run to Moscow. You run, you go to Paris, London, New York, these three cities. To Moscow, you're not going to go. So they argued that since the Rambam ran to Morocco, why would he go to Morocco? Because obviously he converted. He must have converted to Islam and then reconverted to Yiddishkeit. But to me, this is Narishkeit. There's absolutely no writings, no, no proof, nothing like that, complete speculation. And we have to dis discard this completely. But I just wanted to let you know this in case you run through this and, and your study of the Rambam, that this is something, of an opinion that comes forth. He did spend a little time in Morocco and then went to Israel. He came to Israel, Israel at that time already, and we're going to go back a little bit to talk about the Crusades, it was post-Crusade time. And in Israel there was already a mixture of Christians and Arabs, because now you're talking about in the middle, in the middle and close to the end of the 12th century, the 1170s, 60s and 70s, already there was, had been a number of Crusades and there was Christians. He was not impressed with the Christians living in Israel. He was not impressed, but he was impressed, he liked it. He liked the Muslims. He, he always wrote that if you have to go, you're not allowed to daven in a church. You cannot pray in a Catholic church because there's icons all around. But in a mosque, you may pray because there's no, no, there's, no, there's no icon. So if you go into a mosque and you need a daven mincha, it's okay according to the Rambam. Here's where he got unlucky but lucky. What happened while he was in Israel, he decided to move to Egypt. He felt it was going to be better for him and, you know, his brother, unfortunately, who supported him, died in a, in a terrible accident while he was on the way to doing a business deal. This left the Rambam and his family completely devastated and poor. He had nothing. So, guess what he did? There you go. <laughs> he went to medical school. When all else fails, he becomes a doctor. And I guess medical school, wasn't, medical school wasn't exactly like medical school today. You know, medical school was a little bit different, but he became a doctor. He also lost two children while he was there. So he was left with one son, Rabbi Avram, who later on defended his writings. Okay. He was lucky. Why? Because in history, it's just chance upon chance upon chance, which is really not chance. It's really faith and divine providence. But his brother-in-law happened to be working in the Sultan's palace at the time. The Sultan got ill. And the sultan says, do you know a good doctor? He says, oh, do I know a doctor? Dr. Maimon. And the next thing you know, the Rambam becomes the doctor and the close physician of none other than Saladin. Saladin the Great, who's going to fight a major, major battle against two of the great warriors in Europe, and that's Richard the Lionhearted and the King of France. Okay? These two are going to gang up later on on Saladin, and Saladin is going to beat them because they didn't realize the first rule of, law, of war. And you know what that is? Home court advantage. <laughs> they forgot about home court advantage. They brought with them 250,000 soldiers. Okay, that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? And Saladin had 300,000 soldiers. The only difference is, for every soldier that Saladin lost, he replaced them with two. Okay? Every soldier that the Christians lost, they replaced them with None. Okay? So at the end of the first battle, when it was 30,000 Muslims dead and 30,000 Christians dead, it didn't make a difference for Saladin because he just kept sending them like grasshoppers. I mean, and eventually they beat them off and they didn't, they didn't recapture the Holy Land. In all of this milieu finds this rabbi who happens to be now the physician, the personal physician of the, of the Sultan's court. And he comes there and he talks to them and he cures them, etc., etc., etc. et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. And while he's doing all of this, he also happens to be the rabbi of Forstadt, of this huge congregation in Cairo. And he also happens to be writing at the same time, writing, 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 writing. Now, what we know him as, when I say we, the secular world knows him as the great medieval philosopher. They don't really know much for his Talmud acumen or the great book that he wrote, the Yad HaZaka, which revolutionized Jewish, Peru, Jewish law forever. Or they don't know about his introduction to the Mishnah. They don't want to know about his Sefer HaMitzvah, the little book of laws. That doesn't interest them. All they're interested in is one book. And that book is the Mora Nevuchim, the Guide for the Perplexed. Because that book is a direct not attack against Muslim philosophy, but it's a, an apology. It's a, basically, a, it was an apologist for Jewish philosophy. And he wrote it in Arabic, and what he did was he wrote it, he sent it to Ibn Tibun, 
Yehuda Ibn Tibbun, who was his translator, chapter by chapter, and Ibn Tibbun would send it back to him with notes, he would send it back and forth, and that's the way the book got published. It was, it's an extremely difficult book because the Rambam was a, was a lover of Aristotle, he was a real Aristotelian, and he uh, wrote, and he tried to blend the two philosophies, Judaism and Greek philosophy, and one day Yehuda Ibn Tibbun writes him a letter, and this letter is still around today, and he says, can I come visit you because I have a lot of questions, I mean, it's, it's a mounting and not some stuff I don't understand. So the Rambam writes him back his schedule, and he says, if you want to come, listen, this is my schedule. I wake up every day at 4 o'clock. I get on my donkey to go to visit the, 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 the palace. Okay, he goes to the palace, he gets there in the morning. All day from about 7 in the morning, he's seeing people till about 3 in the afternoon. At 3 in the afternoon, they pick him up, he says. Literally, they lift him up and they lay him over the donkey. So he's not riding on a donkey. He's literally laying over the donkey like this. And they send the donkey back to his house. He comes to his house, it's about 4, 4.30. He gets, they lift him up off the donkey, they carry him into the house. He lays down there, his wife feeds him a little bit of, of supper. She has supper prepared for him. And after supper, a, a, he sits down and he waits for about three, four hours. To, people in this community come with different problems. Come in and out, come in and out. By around 9, 10 o'clock at night, he sits down to write. And he writes from about 10 to 2. For four hours, he writes. And at 2, he finally gets to sleep for a couple of hours, and he's back at 4 o'clock, up and at it again. He says, this is my schedule. Tell me when you want to come. <laughs> he says, when, when do you want to come? What? He says, I, well, this, 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 is, this is what I'm dealing with. But he had brunch. I mean, the Rambam, I can't even begin to scratch the surface of what kind of an individual this guy was. When he, I'll just give you one small little story, just to show you what, what kind of a personality he was, because there's hundreds and hundreds of stories, and I urge you all to, if you, haven't, if you don't know much about this man, it's worth, it's worth uh, buying a couple of books on his biography. There's many, many of them. When the Rambam first became rabbi of Farstat, there were two things that bugged him. Two things. The first thing is, is that on the day of the wedding, on a wedding day, the kala, the bride used to get dressed up in the groom's clothes, and the groom would get dressed up in the, in the bride's clothes. For festivity's sake, you know, this was before the, before the wedding. In order to make everybody happy, he would wear her gown and she would wear her, his kapata, whatever they wore in those days. Well, this is a direct prohibition against what it says in the Torah that women should wear their clothes and men should wear their clothes. So he said, what is going on over here? They said, the other rabbis led. He said, I'm not the other rabbis. I'm, my, I'm Rabbi Maimon, and this is forbidden. So he stopped that day one. Okay, party pooper. He stopped that. Okay? The next problem is a problem that has plagued us since Adam's times. What is that? The shul on Shabbos, you couldn't hear the reading of the Torah. Why? Buck, 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 buck. Everybody in Shul was talking. He walked into Shul. He wanted to hear the reading of the Torah. He couldn't hear the reading of the Torah. Everybody in Shul was yapping away. This section was the stock market. This was the sports section. That was the politics section. Here's were Republic. I mean, the Democrats. There were the Republicans. <laughs> there were the his. There was a, everybody had their section in Shul. You know, gossip, row four to seven. Sports, eight to twelve. Anything you want. And people were just talking. He couldn't take it. He just couldn't take it. So he got up. And this is what separates him from everybody else. And he got up and he said like this, in front of the congregation. Okay. If you continue to act this way and continue talking during services, I'm going to abolish prayer. Now, you have to understand, this is not Moses from biblical times who gets up there and says, I'm going to abolish prayer because it's my Torah and I'll do what I like with it. <laughs> this is Maimonides that is living in the 13th century, the 12th, 13th century. And he said, I will absolutely abolish the, the, the Amidah, that we, no one is going to say the Amidah. Now, who, who, if today a rabbi did that, okay, they say, Rabbi, we hope that you enjoy your new stay in Fargo, North Dakota. Thank you very much for being with us. They get rid of this rabbi. What do you think? You think a rabbi today would get up there and abolish the Amidah? But he said, what I'll do is I'll abolish, um, abolish the Amidah, and instead of the Amidah, I'm going to have the cantor say it out loud, and everybody's going to fulfill their obligation by answering Amen. How is that going to help? Because at that moment, you're going to you're have to listen very intently, because otherwise you haven't prayed that morning. The next Shabbos he came to Shul, not a word was uttered. 
This is the kind of rabbi that he was. Well, you know what? Everybody has their good days and everybody has their bad days. And the Rambam had his heyday. After he passed away, a tremendous torrent of opposition fell upon him. A tremendous torrent of opposition. And primarily against one book. What's that? The Guide for the Perplexed. The rabbis from the East, the rabbis in Baghdad, Shmuel ben Eli, wrote against him that he's an apikyrus, he is a heretic, he wasn't religious, he wasn't orthodox. The rabbis in France burned his books. The first book burning that I think, I don't want to bet my last dollar, but I think the first book burnings took place because of the Rambam's books. That the rabbis in France got the Dominicans and the friars, the Dominicans is another, and the Franciscans to read the book, and they burnt the book publicly. They burned the Mara Nebuchadnezzar publicly. This began this whole idea of book burning. You know, later on the Nazis would, you know, go, go, to, go, to, go to town with all of the burnings of the book. No one did this while he was alive. They waited till he died in 1204. It was left to his son, Abraham, to defend his father. And we have all of Abraham's writings. Hagos HaMaimonis, we have all of his writings, and I just finished a book by him, attacking the rabbis of France, they don't know what they're talking about. Bah, 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 bah. It finally took someone like the Ramban, Reb Moses ben Nachman, who lived 50 years later, to calm it down and say, stop fighting, it's not worth it, it's over. Okay? But here was a situation where in, underneath the very noses of the Muslims, run, living in a Muslim community, all surrounded by Muslims, the Jews had flourished. The Jews had no problems. Now again, I don't want to leave the impression, because I know people are going to say, ah, you know what, there was plenty of times my grandmother and my grandfather told me that in Iraq, in 1872, they fought Jews. Yeah, of course. There absolutely were times that there was anti-Semitic instances and pogroms under the Muslims. I don't want to paint a picture, an idyllic picture of paradise. I'm just telling you, during this period, within Spain and within this part of Egypt, the Jews were allowed to flourish. The Jews flourished. What happened is that later on, after the year 1000 and 1100, the Christians began what they called the Reconquistada, the reconquering of Spain. Because okay? they couldn't have Muslims living. The Muslims were living right in Europe and controlling Europe. I told you last week that the Muslims made it all the way to France, right to the mountains. And the, 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 the armies in France said, no, no, we can't have this. And they, they fought a battle, and in the years 12, 15, the, the, the reconquering of Spain took place. By the time Reb Nachman, Reb Moshe Reb Nachman came along, by the time the Ramban, not the Rambam, but the Ramban came along, he already was living under, under Christian uh, dominion. He was living under Christianity. Now what was happening here, we all talked about what we call in the world the Sephardim. The Sephardim. The Oriental Jews, the Jews that lived under the Muslim dominion. What happened to the Jews in Europe that lived under Christian dominion? What happened to the Jews that lived in, for example, Germany? There was Jews in Germany, there were Jews in France, there was Jews in England, there were Jews all. What happened to these Jews? So these Jews, what? Well, they, they, had, a, they had a different experience. So, for example, in Germany, where the heart of Ashkenazic Jewry lived, they had flourished. There was Jews in Spire, and in Mines, and in Worms, and in all, many, many cities had flourished and had, had big communities. In the year 1000, one of the great, in, most interesting people came along. His name was Rab, Rabbeinu Gershon Ma'ar HaGoyle. Rabbeinu Gershon, the light of the exile. And he was at the year 1000 or 1050, he was the leading luminary of Ashkenazic Jewry. Their experience, what? Oh, I was going to say, so under his tutelage, under his leadership, now a lot of the things that we do today in the Ashkenazic world were implemented. For example, within Judaism, from the Torah's point of view, polygamy is legal. You can have more than one wife, right? Think about it. How many wives did Jacob have? Come on, how many wives did Jacob have? No. Four wives. Jacob, our forefather, had four wives and 13 children. How many wives did Abraham have? At least two. We know at least two wives in the, in, in, in the Bible. I'm going to get into the prophets. Forget about it. David had at least six. Solomon had at least 600. I mean, you know, we had the many, many. So from the Torah's point of view, polygamy was legal. Now, 
what changed, and what and among the among the Jews living in the Muslim world, they still practiced polygamy. Mm. At that time, they still had multiple number of wives because Islam did not forbade it. Right. Islam Islam allowed the, uh, a number of different wives. Who did not allow a number of different wives? Christianity. Because Christianity had a completely different view on sex than everybody. They have a completely different view. Let's just say that. A completely different view on sexual matters. I mean, you know what? Think about it. Jesus was uh, single. All of the disciples were single. Mary was kind of single, if depending on the Da Vinci Code. You know, I don't know. You know, I want to get into that. But there's a lot of different things. Because Christianity at least claimed that their best, their, their, their goal was to elevate oneself where he became completely celibate. The Pope was celibate. Well, it didn't happen for a long time. It wasn't in day one that they became celibate. But you know what? This, is, this was their goal, to get away from the outside world and to attach yourself to one and only God. And that's the way. And since Jesus was celibate, we're going to be celibate because we want to be Jesus-like. So they had a very completely different view on sexuality than the Muslims had. So Rabbeinu Geshen, for a number of different reasons, looked around and saw that since they were in this milieu, since they were surrounded by Christians, and Christians only had one wife, and here where Jews were marrying a multiple number of wives, he felt it's, it's surpassed nisht. It's, this is not the way to go, because he figured this is, this is too promiscuous, so he forbade polygamy. He put out a decree, it's called Cherem de Rabbeinu Geshen, the excommunication of Rabbeinu Geshen, that anybody who marries more than one wife will be excommunicated from the community, and that was that. And we still adhere to that. Mm. Okay, all right. It was only supposed to be for a thousand years. Okay, but who knows? I mean, it's still on. Forget it, put it that way. It's still on. There's, you, you can't, we're still monogamous. We're still monogamous. Another thing that he instituted was not to read anybody else's mail. You see why, why? Think about this for a moment. Why can you not read anybody else's mail under the punishment of excommunication? You know why? Because think about this. How was trade done in the Middle Ages? Trade was done by writing. So I wrote, okay, I needed coffee. So I'm going to write, I know Bob has coffee. So I'm going to write a, you know, a, 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 a proposal. I'm going to buy your coffee for $25 a pound. I give it to David. I said, David, I want you to deliver this to Bob. Okay, David got on his horse, delivered it to Bob. Now, what happens if David opens up the mail? He reads, hmm, Perlmutter's going to offer $25 a pound. <laughs> now, he runs in and he tells Marvin, Marvin, Perlmutter's offering 25 pounds. You want to offer it 26? This way, it would kill trade. Kill trade. So he forbade the opening up of any mail. If you open up mail and you are found to open up mail, you are in the banishment of excommunication. The Kadaimu Kadaimu, many other things that he instituted that literally sat on the Jewish community in Ashkenaz for till today. Till today, a letter comes into my house and it's addressed Hani. If I should open up that letter, forget, yeah, 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 forget about it. Forget about it. And then you can't hear him the Rabbeinu Gershon. You can't hear excommunication from Rabbeinu Gershon. And he did this in order for Jews, in order to be able to acclimate themselves, not to convert into the community, but at least, you know, not to stick out like a sore thumb. Unfortunately, the community at that time was going through a terrible, terrible period, a period of persecution, and many people converted to Christianity. Because Christianity has always believed, as we mentioned last week, that in order to convert a Jew, you got yourself, hey, hey, you know, you got a Jew to come in, you got yourself a, a gold star. You know, that, that, that's a big one. And Rabbeinu Gershon's son himself converted to Christianity. When he converted, he sat shiva for 14 days. He sat as if his son had died, Shiva, now how, how, much is, how much should you really sit Shiva for? Seven days. He sat for 14 days. When they asked him why Rabbeinu Gershon for 14 days, he said seven for his soul and seven for his body. I mean, his son never, never came back to Judaism. He passed away as a Christian. But those, those were the difficulties living in the Middle Ages. That was in 1095. In the year 1095, Pope Urban called for the first crusade. He got together a number of people and he called for the first crusade to go back. What were the crusades really? What was the whole idea of the crusades? That it was a shanda. Do we know what the word shanda means? In Yiddish, the word shanda was a shame that Israel, the place where Jesus Christ himself walked, a place where the holy uh, church of the sepulcher, where he is buried, was under the dominion of whom? The Muslims. Heretics! 
Heretics were running. How could they live this? Now you know why Jesus didn't come back? He argued, because we're sitting over here fat and happy in Europe, and the Lord is stuck there with the, with the infidels. So he called for the first crusade. The first crusade ended miserably, never even made it to Israel. The first crusade was led by a person by the name of Peter the Hermit, a terrible anti-Semite, a terrible organizer, just a, a crazy guy. They weren't organized. They got together. They started marching. They ended up being beaten in Constantinople, what today is Istanbul, and they never made it. But on the way, they caused tremendous havoc for the Jewish people. Tremendous havoc. And the three towns that I mentioned to you in the spring of 1096 were com almost completely wiped out. Spire, Mainz, and Worms. Shum, as they used to call it. It was three great towns. It was completely, they were almost completely wiped out. Probably 10 to 20,000 people were killed. Now, we talk about numbers, 10 to 20,000 people. <laughs> What's 10 to 20,000 people? Auschwitz did about 8,000 people on a good day. They were killing 8,000 Jews in Auschwitz on one day. So what was 10 to 20,000? But in those days, comparatively, it was a large number of people and the shock to the system. This had never happened before. Okay, Jews had lived under, the, under Charlemagne and they'd lived under other Christian rulers, but they never had this, 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 this gang, this, this, this pogrom that would come and decimate city after city. They'd never lived like that. And they thought to themselves, Rabbi Nishleilam, what's going on over here? This was the first time in the history of the Jewish people, besides the wars with the Romans, that large scale massacres took place. It was going to repeat itself a number of times in Europe till ultimately leading to the Holocaust. But this was the very first time, was in the, in the first crusade. Ultimately, there were nine crusades. They tried nine times to knock off the Muslims. Many of them were small little crusades. They even had a children's crusade. They had a crusade led by, by, King, by uh, Louis IX, or as he's called in the French lexicon, Louis the Saint Louis. They anointed him as a saint. Louis the Ninth, but every one of them went down to failure. They could not knock off. For a little while, they did recapture Jerusalem, but ultimately they were, they were destroyed. In, in Spain was reconquered by the, by the Christians. Now, the funny thing was that we're not going to hear much more about Jews in the Muslim countries for a very long time. And scholarship would rapidly descend within the Muslim world. Why? Because it, did, because it descended in the Muslim world, where the Muslims were producing books of philosophy, Averroes, great scholars, that stopped. And they descended, so Jewish scholarship in these places also descended. Where did scholarship start to rise up was now become Europe. And Europe had a very different kind of relationship with the Christian masters. It could really be encapsulized in the year 1267. And this is in Barcelona, Spain. A fellow by the name of Hermesha ben Nachman. I'd mentioned him before. He's called Nachmanides. And the ruler at that time in Barcelona was King John, uh, King John, of, King John of Argon. Okay? And he was the ruler of Barcelona. Now, this is before the Inquisition. We'll get to that in just one moment. But what, does, what happened now was there was pressure upon all of the secular rulers all of the kings, the ministers, the prime ministers, all of these guys, that one thing, you got to convert the Jews. You have to convert the Jews. This is literally a stick in our neck. It's a bone in our throat. To have Jews living beside us and in our communities is just simply an abomination. And the church put on tremendous pressure on the temporal powers of that day to convert the Jews. And the same thing was true about King John of Argon. So, this one converted Jew, Pablo Cristiani, as he called himself, because, you know, what else? If you're a converted Jew, you don't take the name of uh, Michael, uh, you know, Michael McMillan. No, you take the name of Jesus Christ the Incarnate, right? That's the name, that's the name you take. So he called himself Pablo Cristiani, okay? So this Pablo Cristiani came with an idea to the, to, the, to the king. He said, John, probably sir, or your majesty, rather than just John, I have it. I got it. What do you got, Pablo? He says, I know how to convert all the Jews in Barcelona. How are you going to do that? He says, I am going to challenge the rabbi to a debate. A debate? You sure you want to do that? He says, oh, I'm telling you. Because you know what's going to happen? If I convert the rabbi, the rest of the community is putty in my hands. Unlike in this congregation, because if I convert, no one else, of course, is going to convert. They'll all run, right? <laughs> Good, okay, I just want to make sure. But in there... 
since he was so well, such an esteemed rabbi, Reb, Reb Nachman of, of uh, Reb, uh, Nachmanides, that Pablo was certain that he's going to convert Nachman, every, Reb, I call him Nachman, Reb Moshe, everybody else is going to convert. So the king called in, and he was a decent man, King John, and he called him in and he said, Reb Mo Moses, are you ready to uh, debate him? He said, I'll debate him on one condition. On one condition. What's that condition? That I'm free to speak. If I'm going to sit there and I'm going to have to have my hands tied and I'm going to have to be careful of what I say, I'm not debating. Count me out. But if you let me speak freely, so he looked at Pablo and he says, do you accept him? He says, yeah, why not? Who cares? What is well, he said, I'm going to wipe the floor with him. Okay. So the king signs off. They all get their lawyers, look at the papers. Don King, Bob Arum, you know, all the big people in Vegas. This is going to be the, this pay-per-view. It's great. Everybody is guaranteed a piece of the cut. They sign off everybody. Okay. Let me tell you, in hindsight, this was a fight. Nothing against David, he's a wonderful guy. He's a brilliant lawyer. But if you put him in the ring with Mike Tyson at his, <laughs> at his prime, my money's on Mike Tyson. Unless David, of course, talks him to death. No, no, no. But, but David against Mike Tyson, this is what the fight was all about. I mean, you have to understand that Moshe Ben Nachman was one of the greatest scholars, not only of his time, but of all time, he's in the Hall of Fame in Judaism, in the top 50 for sure, maybe the top 25. He was an unbelievable scholar. What he forgot, Pablo Christiani in a million years would never know. And the first day debate went very bad against Pablo. Because everything, he showed him that, you know what, you're, you're misinterpreting the verses, you don't know anything about the Talmud, you know nothing about the Old Testament, forget about the New Testament. He just wiped the floor. Okay, so he figured the first day, he got lucky. You know what, like, like, like David with the slingshot on Goliath. He'll get him the second day. By the second day, it was even worse. You know what, as a matter of fact, everything in the debate is recorded today. It's called the Disputation. If you want to, you could look it up and uh, you could look it up in Google. You could buy the book called The Disputation because the Rambam wrote everything down. Everything that went on, every word that he said, every word that Pablo said he, written, he wrote down. On the third day, he got up and he said, listen, Okay, because he saw he was on the ropes already. And he said, I just want to say, and you have to understand this. Here's in 1267, in a Catholic country, far removed from Israel, surrounded by bishops and, and priests and cardinals and kings, and the Nachmanides gets up like this, like I'm standing here in front of you. And he says, you know what? The biggest proof, listen to these words, because this is unbelievable. The biggest proof against Christianity is, you know what? Christians. And they go, what? You know what? What? He says, that's right. You claim that you're a, you're, you're, you're a religion of peace? You claim that there's peace in the New Testament? And you are the biggest murderers ever to come on the face of the earth. You claim to be good people and you're the worst people on the face of the earth. And he went on for a rant for about 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, King John got up and says, the debate is over. Thank you very much for coming. Try the brisket. We'll be here till Thursday. Thank you. And he ushered everybody out and he said, you, Rabbi, in my study immediately. Okay? He called him into his study and he said, are you out of your mind? You, 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 you cannot say this. This is Barcelona. This is not New York City circa 1995. You know, with the ACLU, you're going to protect your rights. This is Barcelona. How do you get up and say that the worst proof against Christianity is the Christians? They're going to massacre you. I know what they're planning right now, he tells them. Right now, they're building an auto de fe for you. Right now, they're going to hang you up. So I'm telling you, I'm telling you, since you are a good man and an honest man, he put, took his drawer, opened up, he had 300 gold coins. He said, take these 300 gold coins, don't go back home. Because as soon as you walk out that door... I'm going to call in one of the guards. He's going to escort you to a ship. You're going to take that ship and you're going to get out of here. And that's what happened. They escorted him right to the ship. He got on the ship and he sailed to Israel. Because Israel was under the dominion of the Muslims. Out of the hands, out of the reach of the Catholic Church. He came to Israel. He called for his family who later joined him in Israel. This was in 1267. He went straight to Jerusalem. And guess what he could not find there? A minion. There weren't 10 families living in Jerusalem at the time. This was post, see what the, what, what the, uh, what, what, what the, 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 uh, um, uh, the Crusades did. They literally wiped out the Jewish community in, in, in Jerusalem. He paid for 10 families from Hebron to move to Jerusalem so he should have a minion, be able to, to daven in a quorum. And this shul still exists today. 
700 years. His shul is in the old city called the Ramban Shul. You can go there, you can pray there. It, 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 it lasted 700 years to a number of different wars and everything. And of course, in 1967, the Israeli soldiers recaptured the shul and they rededicated it the next week. And it's called the Ramban Shul. This was part of the experience of, of, of Jews living now in Christian Spain. A hundred years later, in the year 1367, they had another debate. This was called the Great Debate of Tortosa. This one didn't go so well. It was a two-year debate. A two-year debate. It, in, it, in, it, in, it, in, it in captured and it had in hand four, no, no, 300 rabbis took, took part of this debate. 100 rabbis converted to Catholicism during the debate. 100. They couldn't take it. The pressure was so hard on them until ultimately what happened to Spanish Jewry was the coming of what we call the Inquisition. The Inquisition was a, 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 a concentrated, organized, planned attack upon the Jewish people in order to convert them. And when Isabel and Ferdinand got together in 1492, under the direct orders of Thomas Torquemada, Yamach Shemay, may his name be blotted out forever, the Jews were forced to leave. August the 2nd, 1492, was exactly the same day that who sailed? Christopher Columbus. Sailed exactly the same day. And if you look it up, I never looked it up, but if you look it up, the day is supposed to be Tisha B'Av. It's Tisha B'Av that the Jews were pushed out of Spain. At the height, there was 500,000 Jews living in Spain. At the end, there was probably 250,000, probably 100,000 of them converted to Catholicism over the years and 50,000 probably left. Franco, you know, the great, the great general Franco that, that fought the war in Spain, the civil war in Spain prior to World War II, when asked by Hitler to give up the Jews of Spain, he said no, because according to your definition, I'm also a Jew. At least 25 to 35 percent of all Spaniards could definitely go back and trace their lineage to Jewish people. There's no doubt about it. That's how, that's how prevalent the, 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 uh, the conversions was. Tens of thousands converted. Now many of the converted, I can't say how many exactly, there's a lot of debate among this, but some of the converted were called Moranos, and Nusib, that they lived this openly life as a Catholic, but in the house, they were Jewish. But if you were caught as a Morano, you were immediately killed. I mean, there's nothing to talk about. You were, you were put on the auto de fe, you were tortured, you were burned. Terrible, tor ter terrible things happened to you. But there were some Jews that still held on to this. When the Jews left Spain, many of them moved to Portugal. But eventually Portugal also was under the dominion of the, of the, of, of, of the uh, Catholic Church. And this is the interesting part. From Portugal, they moved out to many different places. One of the places they went to was Brazil. Brazil. They went to Brazil. A group of a shipload of Jews went to Brazil. And in 16, so they ended up in Brazil, New York City, and started the Jewish community in the United States of America. So, if, what? United States to be. I mean, eventually, you know, United States to be. They came there, you know, we have, it was uh, the terrible times in New York. We know that Peter Stuyvesant, another Jew lover, jokingly, yeah, right. another Jew lover wouldn't uh, let them open up a shul, but he got a letter from the Dutch, uh, the, uh, the, the Dutch uh, trading corporation of which then owned New Amsterdam, and he told them, let them open up a shul, what do you care? Oh boy, I wish he was alive today. Oi, would I take him on a tour of New York City? Oi, you know, this, this grace of genius that bought Manhattan for $23 or $24 from the Indians, all right? This great genius, I would take him to every shul in Manhattan and, and then I would finish him off by taking him to, uh, to, co to where? Brooklyn. Uh, to Brooklyn, but I would kill him by going into a kosher restaurant because that he couldn't imagine. It's one thing about a kosher, a shul, but a kosher restaurant in Manhattan, that would kill him to pastrami and hopefully sooner than later. But this is, this is how the Jews ended up going from Spain to Portugal to Brazil to the United States of America. Many of them, the outcasts of the ones that couldn't, couldn't make it to Brazil, went from Portugal to Italy. 
Among them was one of the great, great scholars, Rabdan Yitzhak Abarbanel. You might have heard of Rabdan Yitzhak Abarbanel. Abarbanel was one who actually became the prime minister under Ferdinand and Isabella. And he was one guy that they gave an out. They said, you can stay. And what am I going to stay with? Like the only Jew in, in Spain. So he left too. So he went from Portugal. He went to Italy. And many people ran, surprisingly, to a place called Holland, the Netherlands. Now, the Netherlands is a very interesting place. Why? I'll talk a little bit about the Netherlands, and I'll open up for questions if anybody, you know, has not We've talked about, we've covered a lot of different geography and time periods. The Netherlands was one of the first countries to adopt a new system of Christianity. Exactly. In the middle of the 16th century, there was a uh, priest by the name of Martin Luther. We all know the story. I think it was in 1517. He came to the, to the church in Wittenberg. He had 95 questions. We all know the story. He attached his 95 questions to the door. He broke with the Catholic Church, and he founded what we know today as the Protestant movement. Okay? It was then called the Reformation. In the beginning, Martin Luther was very friendly to the Jews. He said, and he wrote many wonderful, loving things about the Jews. He said, you know why the Jews don't convert? It's because the Christians have mistreated them. The Catholic Church has instituted anti-Semitism against them. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Who said the same thing last week? Remember? Who said the same thing? I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. Jesus. Nah, his name starts with an M. And he lived in the Arabian Peninsula. Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed said the same thing. If we treat them nicely, they're going to convert. So Martin Luther took this approach too and said, you know what, let's be nice to them, let's be good to them, we welcome them, they're smart, they're good, and they'll convert. They didn't convert, and Martin Luther became a rabid anti-Semite. If you want to read something about his writings, you can read of Jews and their lies. And he purports that we should burn their synagogues, they should live in the barns like pigs. I mean, you know, every vile thing against them. But the Netherlands became a stronghold of Protestantism. And with this Protestantism, it wasn't Lutheran Protestantism. It was an era of at least seemingly enlightenment, tolerance. And Jews ran to, New, to, 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 uh, to, to the Netherlands. And they lived in Amsterdam, they flocked there. And many, many, many great people grew up in this milieu. One of the great people that grew up, and I think, I think he's a great person. I mean, you know, great, not always denoting that the most religious person was by a fellow by the name of Benedict Spinoza, or Bento, as is me and the guys used to call him. When we got together for a beer every once in a while in The Hague, they called him Bento. Bento came from a Murano family, that's clear. I mean, that's, that, there's no, 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 no doubt about that. And until 13, 14 years old, he got a very, very thorough, very strong Jewish education. Talmud, prophets, Jewish law, Chumash, Bible study, very, very well versed. At 13, his father passed away. His father died what? Choir practice. Choir, yeah, choir practice, everything. He did everything. He got involved in all aspects of the shul. At 13, his father passed away. He uh, had to, uh, at 18, I think his mother then, or his mother first at 13, his father at 18, he had to go into business. He had two brothers and I believe three sisters. Uh, I think uh, he lost a brother and a sister, so maybe there was four still. He went into business, but his head was not into business. His head was into philosophy. And he ran into a number of heretics and a number of non-Jewish, as we called heretics, or at least heretical scholars, and Spinoza began to doubt the validity of the Bible. At 23 years old, he was excommunicated from the Jewish community. 23 years old, a young man, they excommunicated him. I think they made him lay down on the doorstep and everybody stepped over him. Terrible, terrible thing. Anyways, he left the community and he wrote his book called Ethics where he argues very prominently against the divinity of the Bible and against a personal God and against a divine God and against everything that Judaism held sacred. Everything that Judaism held sacred. Then he wrote his political thesis uh, his, his, I think it's called the thesis on politics and society. That was his magnum opus, and that basically finished everything off. He took the very foundation on what religion, not only Judaism, but Christianity, was based upon. It was kicked out from under by Spinoza, and the rest, as we call it, is history. Now, the Jewish community completely divorced themselves from him. 
absolutely divorced themselves from him. As a matter of fact, after he died, his sister Deborah ran to the Hague to see if he had any money. The moment she found out that there was no money in the will, she left. She hadn't spoken to him in 20 years. But she said, yeah, listen, you know what? Who knows? You know, what the guy could have left. They were ashamed of him. Why? Because that was in the political thing that was going on there. Even though you had tolerance in, in the Netherlands, but still you're living in a Christian country. You can't just get up there and say that everything in the Bible is completely narishkeit and the New Testament is nothing worth and it's not divine. You just cannot say that in a, in a Christian country. No matter how tolerant this is, not New York City 1995. It's just not. So the Jewish community was afraid because everywhere he went, they all knew that Spinoza was Jewish. I mean, he didn't hide. He never converted. He never cut himself off from Judaism. He always claimed that he was a Jew, but this is, the Judaism is a new thing. This is not what we think that Judaism is all about. Spinoza heralded in what, the, what we call, he wasn't the first guy, but he heralded an era of enlightenment where we now become critical thinkers that the way to enlightenment is not by believing in some hocus pocus, but it's by, leaving in the, by believing everything in the mind. Logically, rationally, we could live as people because what we're really aspiring to is to be thinking people. Oy, oy, oy. We don't know what to do with this guy. We don't know what to do with this guy because, you know what, he caused a tremendous revolution in the world. Later on, when his writings began to appear everywhere, people were now challenged. How are you going to answer him? What are you going to say to Spinoza? He has some good points, right? He has something to, worth talking about. This, era, this heralded in a whole new era in Western Europe. A whole new wind was blowing. And it was called the Enlightenment. And during the Enlightenment, a lot of different things were going were to be going on. And one of them was the ascendancy of scholarship in Western Europe and basically the descent of the, of, of the community in Spain, certainly that was decimated. The communities in North Africa, which we had talked about so much about in, in Morocco, Jews were living there, but the scholarship was not the same. Now everything turned eastward into Germany, Russia, Poland, um, Lithuania, and this was the place that Judaism was going to rise up again. Any questions at this point? David. Yes, you were talking about uh, uh, how Jews live in, in, in Italy and all that and became as merchants. What about imagery of Jews out there? Because we know one of the great Western writers of the will, the ball that's back in the Paul Miller, William Shakespeare, yeah. his famous, um, famous um, Merchant of Venice. Exactly. Okay, image of the Jew. Okay, so first of all, Shakespeare, there's a very good chance Shakespeare never met a Jew. That's probably. True, because from, from the year 1290 until Oliver Cromwell, there were no Jews living in England. And if they were living in England, they were so deep buried that no one even knew about them. All right, until Cromwell you know, allowed Jews to come in thanks to Menashe ben Israel, the great rabbi and the great diplomat throughout the entire world. So it's a good chance that Shakespeare never knew, never knew a Jew, but their image always was one of you know, being an internationalist, a capitalist, right? Shylock, a pound of flesh, right? So of course, you know, now. now I, I, it's, it's easy to discard Shakespeare as being an anti-Semite and stereotypical against a Jew. But you know what? That's the way people perceive them. Since you never met them, since you don't know them, you never had interaction with them, later on it was going to be much worse. Trust me. Later Shakespeare was kind to what was later going to be said. Because once Jews got into the banking business in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, when they really started to create a lot of capital and they would play one war against another and make money, that's really when <laughs> Marx, you listen to what Marx wrote and what other people wrote about the Jewish people, then it's a completely different story. But the image of the Jew, depending upon who you interacted with. So Shakespeare had no interaction. He looked at the Jews one, you know, one way. In Italy, for example, they looked at the Jews a completely different way. You had the Shadal living there, and Reb Shmuel David Luzato, and other great scholars. They, re they represented, um, um, I know, the Jews lived very well in Italy for, for many, many years. As a matter of fact, one of the few places that gave up the Jews last was Italy. Mussolini was reluctant to give up the Jews. The Pope, for everything you could say about the Pope, was reluctant to give up the Pope's Jews. In Italy, ultimately, many of the Jews in Italy were killed in a concentration camp in Italy itself. You know, they, they killed many of the Jews. But, for example, the Italians had no problems for many years you know, with the Jews and other countries handling that. But it all depends upon which era, which milieu, who was there and how they interacted and what they, what, what they saw about the Jewish people. 
you know, Spinoza himself was a contrast. On one hand, he was a great philosopher. On the other hand, he was a Jew. So you had this dilemma. Well, how do you look at this guy? You know, he's a her heretical Jew. So anybody in, 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 uh, in, for example, in Holland who wanted to disparage Jews had a perfect time. Look at this. Look, we, we let the people in. Look what they do to us. We let them in and they blow up our, our, our savior. All right? For the people who wanted to, uh, who, who, who praised Spinoza, always praised him with, eh, he's a smart Jew. Okay? <laughs> He's a smart, but he's Jew. He's, he's still a Jew. He, he, couldn't, you know, he couldn't win. But ultimately, they never forced him to convert. They never forced him to convert. And he made a meager living because, you know, that's what he wanted to do. He was a, he was a lens grinder. You know, and he, gr he ground lenses, you know, for a living. And that's what he wanted to have. He never, he never married. I don't know if he ever was in love with anybody. He was an oddball. I'm sure that, you know, all the guy talked about was philosophy. So he didn't, he didn't do well in sports bars. You know, like, who cares? You know, like, you're trying to watch the Laker game and he's trying to ask you if there's free will. How do you, how, how do you justify the, the free will and, and predetermination? And you say, shut up, I'm watching the game. I mean, that was, the, that, we, we sort of, that was one of the books that, you know, did came out after he passed away. We, we, that was, you know, you know, all of that stuff. So therefore, you had this dilemma. But about, they, they, they kind of accepted Jews, but always with an asterisk, right? And that's the way it went in, in, in Europe. Oh, Germany had Jews since the, since the year 1000, even before 1000. I mean, Jews were in Germany, you know, with the, with, with the Romans probably. Way back, way back when, in the second, third, and fourth century, we already have history. There's a great book. Um, it's a yellow book. Oh, I have it in my house about the history of German Jews. But they, they, they were there oh, at least a at least 1,000 years. There were, there were Jewish communities in Germany. I mean, but again, German Jews had their ups and downs. I mean, on, on one hand, that's one of the most fascinating histories of any Jewish community is, is German Jews because they saw everything. I mean, they saw the conquest, you know, of um, you know of the Christians that came in and converted converted these tribes that that lived there, and uh, they they saw the ascendancy of Christianity, and you know, at that point, then they saw that, uh, like a dead a, a dead period, you know, for hundreds of years, and then when, again when the when the Crusades came, they took the brunt of it, and then all of a sudden they they rose back up. In France, people were being bowed out, bang, back forth, and they were exiled and, and led in a number of different times. The Jews in Germany always stayed. Germany was not really a country like we think of Germany today. It was a bunch of states, really city-states, that later on only really through um, uh, Bismarck really became one. You know, we united all of these. Well, it was little city-states. But certainly, the best, the, when, when, when the Enlightenment came, and Germany came out and Prussia. really started to, uh, what? Prussia. Prussia. And then it really started to dominate the world in, in all of this. That's when the Jewish community really, 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 like Moses Mendelssohn and, you know, and Heinrich Heine, who converted, but he was, still, he was still Jewish, and Felix Mendelssohn, who converted, but, you know, was still Jewish. And many, many tremendous scholars, you know, came out of Germany. The reform movement, of course, was started in Germany, as was probably the conservative movement. It was started during modern orthodoxy, was started, was started in Germany. Germany was, at that time, during the 19th century, a real haven and a hotbed of religion. You know, when it was enlightenment, and then it was, you know, so the German Jews had a, had a tremendously long and very colorful and interesting history, you know, in it. And, uh, and a lot of great people came out of, came out of Germany at that time, as, and they were all Yekes. That's a surprising part of it. I mean, you know what a Yekke is? A Yekke is a German Jew. Very, very, very German Jews are, are known to be very precise. If you go, if you, if you, you're a descendant of German Jews. Yes. Oh, okay, now we know what the problem is, okay. <laughs> now we know, now we know. But if you go into a German show, like for example, if you go into a German show in New York City and they say services start at 8 o'clock, you look at that watch. The moment that watch hits 8 o'clock, they don't care if there's one person show or 900. They're starting because that's, the that's the way Germans are, right? Germans are very precise and very industrious. If you go to Italy and they tell you it starts at 8 o'clock, show up at 9 o'clock because that's about when it's going to happen at 9 o'clock. And if you go to a Hasidic show, if you go to a Eurasian European show, if they tell you it's 10 o'clock, show up at 3 o'clock, because that's usually around the same time that they're going to start. And if you go to a Chabad house, don't go. No, no. If you go to, if you go to a Chabad house and they tell you it's davening starts at 10 o'clock, it's usually around 1.30, because they have to say about 10 l'chaims before and to get ready for davening, etc., etc. But that's, 
that was basically the history. I mean, see, the history of European Jewry, that's starting from the Middle Ages and from this like 16th century non is so colorful and so full. You know, we know so much about it and so much has been written and it's just, it's just unbelievable what Jews were able to accomplish when they were left alone. I mean, this, I can't even begin to tell you what kind of scholarship. For example, Jews in Poland were there for 700 years before Hitler killed, killed them all. I mean, they came in in the year 1313. King Casimir of Poland welcomed the Jews in. I mean, think about it. The King Casimir of Poland welcomed the Jews in as they were running away from other... They were kicked out of Russia and kicked out of other places. He let them in. He, he, he found them to be quite agreeable. And they stayed from, stayed from the 14th century till the 20th century. You know, I mean, and what they and the scholarship that came out of Poland and Lithuania and and, and, and White Russia and Belarus and Germany and and and, and it's, it's 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 unbelievable. It's unbelievable. That just today, I just read an article today that argued, you know, there's a there's a tremendous. I didn't even realize this, but there's a tremendous disconnect between the the, the Jewish community in Israel and American Jewish community. For example, the Jewish community in Israel never studies anything about the diaspora. They know nothing about American Jewry. They don't care, they don't know, they don't want to know, that's not, they're not interested. They love American products. I mean, Green Day is selling and, and then movies are selling. But as far as the Jewish community is concerned, they know very little. The same thing is true about, the, about our kids. Our kids know very little about what's going on in Israel, very little. How, how children live in Israel and what they feel about being in Israel. See, children in Israel feel Jewish. They know one thing, Judaism means what? Living in a Jewish state surrounded by Jews. In New York, what does Judaism mean? that your mother belongs to B'nai B'rith, your father may, belongs to some country club, and you get bar mitzvah. That's about it. That's what Judaism has boiled down to. So it's a completely disconnect. Now the writer is arguing in this article that what, why is this true? Because he says that normally what happens is, is that you have a mother. The mother has two children. And the two children basically come together because they're, over, they're, they're brought up by the mother. Even if one son is living in New York and the other son is living in California and the mother is living in Kansas City, she has influence on both of these children and somehow the family stays together. Where, where, where did, the, where did the, 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 the Jewish community in Israel come from? Primarily early on, Europe, Eastern Europe, right? Germany, Russia, Poland, right? Where did, where did the American Jewish community come from primarily? If you look at the lower side, Russia, Poland. Now there was two communities that both splintered. Where was the mother? Europe. What happened to the Jews in Eastern Europe? Wiped out. And he says, that's the problem. The mother was killed. And when the mother was killed, it caused this complete disconnect between these two, the two brothers. The brother in New York forgot about the brother in California. The brother in California forgot about the brother in Israel. And that was that. So he argues this point. It may be val it might, it might, it might have some validity to it. You know, I'm not sure. But this is this is this is the reality of today that we know very little about how Jews live in Israel. We go visit and they take you around to the King David Hotel and they show you all the great sites. But the average Jew in Israel, how he lives and what his makeup, what he feels about Judaism is completely different to what we see in Judaism. Completely different. I mean, he grows up a Yom Kippur. It's not a day to when you go to Shul. That's not what Yom Kippur is all about. Yom Kippur, the country closes down. That's it, it's finished. You know, if you want to eat, you've got to go to Jaffa, mm -hmm. to where the Arabs are, and go to an Arab restaurant and enjoy yourself with some, uh, you know, falafel. You're not going to get a Jewish store, it's not going to be open on Yom Kippur. What does the average American kid know about Yom Kippur? You get dressed up in your suit, your father drives you to Shul, you sit there with your family, some guy gets up to call Nidre. You want to kill yourself. Give me a gun. By the time the next day rolls around and they're not eating by 3 o'clock, you're finished. That's what Yom Kippur is all about. To us, it's, to us, it's, to us, it's a burden. On the other hand, we, we, we define Judaism with completely different eye glasses. We see Judaism very, very differently. And that's a kind of a problem because, you know, we're so disconnected from these two communities. And this is really where the Jewish community lives now. I mean, there's a few Jews in France and England here and there. But primarily, it's the United States and it's, and it's Israel. And, oh, well, that's not for today. Charlotte, go ahead. Oh yeah, the Germans, there were Jews in Germany way before, way before there was a Netherlands. Netherlands had, Netherlands had Jews in the low countries that were Jews, but not, not nearly as developed as Germ, that German communities were. Not nearly. Don't forget, Jews had come to Germany along with the, with the Romans. The Romans had fought all the way to Germany. Germans were the ones that stopped, actually, the Roman conquest. There were the farmers, the great, there was a the famous battle, the Battle of, uh, uh, not Bohemia, um, 
I forgot the name of the battle, but, um, but they, they stopped the Roman, they really literally stopped the greatest, strongest army on the face of the earth. And who stopped them? Farmers. Literally farmers and merchants and people stopped the Roman conquest. Why? Because even the, Ro the Romans learned home field advantage. You know, you get, you get to the Rhine Valley and you get to, to the mountains and you sit in the mountains and you fight a dirty war, a guerrilla war, and they defeated them. So the Jews had come along with the, you know, with, the, with the Romans and settled there in the Rhine Valley. So Jews were there <laughs> hundreds of years. And then later on, Jews would trickle to Western Europe and get to Gaul and France and Netherlands, you know, and this. But certainly Germany was one of the first few, as well as Italy and Greece. I mean, Jews lived in Italy and Greece all through the Roman Empire. The, the Jews who uh, were in Germany a long time ago were coming from a different place to the Jews that were like in the Netherlands, the Jews who came to Portugal. Right? Correct, correct. They'd, they had, they, had, they lived in, under differently. They were called, you know, they were, they, this was the divide between Svardim and Ashkenazim because as the communities to started to develop and, you know, they began to get a character, there were some Ashkenazic Jews that were primarily living under Christian domain already. They had developed their own way of speaking, their own way, their own language. Yiddish came out of Germany. I mean, we had a whole new language, a, a language of all of our own, Yiddish. I mean, you know, no Svardim spoke Yiddish. I mean, the German Jews spoke Yiddish, Polish Jews, Russian Jews, I mean, that was the language. Svardim had their own language, Ladino, you know, that they spoke, you know, this. But it was two separate communities that, that grew up all together. So you had, the, you had basically the, the countries like, uh, like, like Italy, like Italy and Spain and Greece, which was primarily a, a Svardic. Jews, and you had the countries like Germany, Poland, Russia, Lithuania, that were Ashkenazic Jews, and that's basically how, they, how, it, how, how it worked its way out. And, and it's funny because the scholarship which started as Svardim, like the Rambam, I mean, he, was a, he, he called himself a proud Svardi, shifted slowly to Eastern European, where by the time the 14th century and the 15th century came around, you had already, you know, all, most of the scholarship was already in, 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 in Ashkenaz. Is that good? It's an interesting question. The Yiddish language is a really a bastardization of German. So you, we already had Yiddish probably hundreds of years already. Now exactly, you know, pinpointed, I don't know. That's, that, that, that's a good question. But I would, I would presume that the time of around, you know, when you started to have, you know, a bit of, a, a bit of like, an, you know, enlightenment and openness, that's when Yiddish really, really took hold, you know, of, as a language itself. Because... Uh, Either, either because primarily people were not speaking Hebrew or because it's easier to get along and it was German so you could understand German and speak Yiddish. Even now if you speak Yiddish you kind of pick up a little bit of German, you know, here and there. But I, I would suspect in the Middle Ages is really when Yiddish started to take off, you know, as a language and really had its zenith, you know, in the last century when, uh, you know, with Yiddish writing and Yiddish culture, etc., etc. It just went on, together. right? Uh, number one, number two. Um, in Greece, they had two populations. One was Spartac, but one was old, uh, basically. Yeah, it is an Ashkenazic, but it, it, they came from the old Greeks, the Greeks who lived in Greece from years yeah. back. Sure. And then the Spartan migrated in, so there were two. There were two populations right. in Greece. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, yeah. You're talking about uh, communities that were ancient, ancient in Greece. Right. Ancient. Yeah, is Yiddish, Yiddish is dying? Is Yiddish dying? Is well, that? certainly Hitler didn't do us any favors by wiping out the, the, the vast population who spoke Yiddish. There are still pockets of Yiddish being spoken. Hasidim speak Yiddish. The Lithuanians and yeshivas speak only Yiddish. There's groups in Israel that speak, you know, Yiddish. And even the Yiddish culture kind of is trying to have a bit of a revival. There is a fellow in Amherst. Massachusetts that, is, that has collected over one million Yiddish books. It's a depository of Jewish culture. So I would say, is, but, but just to give you an example, the Forwards newspaper. The Forwards once had a, had a publication probably of 100,000, maybe probably even more, 100,000. I remember when I was a kid, you used to go buy the Forwards and it was sold out. You couldn't get enough Forwards in Montreal because everybody was reading the Forwards. Now the Forwards is all in English with a small little section in Yiddish. And there's probably 15,000 readers of it. So that gives you some idea of where it's going. It's not, it's not really growing much 
except among Hasidim and other specialized groups that, that have kept on the Yiddish language. But to the average American, it's, you know, it's kind of a language that's a folklore. It's like Gaelic. You know, I mean, uh, how many people in how many people how many people speak Gaelic in in, in the Irish? Yeah, no, Welsh. You know, all that. That's those kind of things. I mean, you know, it's sad. It's sad because it's it's you know we we watch here in Sunday morning we, we see the living Torah of the Rebbe and the Rebbe always spoke in Yiddish. This was the language that people spoke in Eastern Europe. This was the language that they that that, that they communicated with. And they wrote in Yiddish and spoke in Yiddish. And, but it's uh, you know. Fortunately, it's a language that's going by the wayside, and certainly with the ascendancy of Hebrew in Israel, mm. most Israelis think, well, who needs Yiddish? Well, well, what is Yiddish? Yiddish is, to them, is like a throwback to a bitter period. Mm. Yiddish reminds you of what? Of, of pogroms, of ghettos, of persecution, of not good times. Hebrew is the language, the freedom of nationalism, of, uh, of, 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 of independence, of hope. That, that's that's a big difference, you know. You know what you were just saying about that article on Israel. Yeah. We were there in 1993. We were there on Shavuos. We were there on the and we were in Siberia. And you know, you walk the streets there, and you just part of it. It's all Jewish. It's not. It's unbelievable. It's, it's different even than walking through a ghetto, say, in New York. Yeah, no, nah, you can't compare. You can't compare. You can't compare. Yeah, you can't compare. No, nah, you can't compare. Listen, as someone said, look, 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 look how we've made it. Some Zionist expressed themselves, look how we've made it. Even the prostitutes in Tel Aviv are Jewish. <laughs> we, finally, we finally made it, right? I mean, look at that. You know, okay, that's, a, that's one way of looking at it, unfortunately. Unfortunately, Bob wants to reiterate that. If you know, you want to you second that? <laughs> now we have, no, now, we're, now we have everything. Now we have everything. Now we have everything. But of course, you know, you, you, you can't compare. You can't compare growing up in Tel Aviv where everything about you is Jewish. Everything you think about is being Jewish. You serve in a Jewish army. You defend a Jewish country, and that's it. And, 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 and even the most secular Jew is, is Jewish. Here, you know, it's, 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 it's a Bob, Bob just came back from Israel. As an American, if you don't go there once like we did, you really don't know what that feels like. No, no. What, what they do, exactly, exactly, exactly. The, what it hurt, what it hits, yeah. And it's Shavuot, it, it doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. Absolutely, you're absolutely. Part of, you're part of a big umbrella. That's what it is, that's exactly, and you don't have to be observant. That was the point I was going to make, is there's so many secular Jews. Right. Jews who know nothing about Judaism. That's it. And, and it's a real big problem. Yeah, because they, they don't, they don't, see themselves as defining themselves as Jews with, with a, through observance. They're Jews by the mere fact that we live here, we defend the country, I wear proudly the Tzahal, you know, the, 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 the Tzava Haganah Yisrael, the Israeli army's insignia on my uniform, that makes me a Jew. That doesn't make a difference if I eat pork, if I, if I, uh, don't, if I work on Shabbos, if I don't have a mezuzah on my door, if I know nothing, I'm Jewish. The fact that I'm here, I'm Jewish. That's it. Here in America, you can't say that. I mean, it's, you just, you just, it just takes a more of an effort to identify with the Jewish community. I also and, say that it's, I, I think it's similar to Jews in America, that, that there are so many Jews in America who aren't observant, I mean, but they're Jewish. I mean, they're just Jewish. They're just yeah, but they define themselves as Jewish very differently than Israeli Jews. Israeli Jews define Judaism as living in a Jewish land, surrounded by Jews, defending the land. American Jews don't, don't think of themselves as Jews that way. American Jews define themselves by one way. You say, what does it mean to be Jewish? We don't believe in Jesus. That's the number one reason what makes a Jew a Jew. I do not believe in Jesus. Do you keep kosher? No. Do you keep Shabbos? No. Do you keep, uh, do you have a mezuzah? No. Do you belong to a shul? No. So what makes you Jewish? I don't believe in Jesus. That's what basically defines an American Jew. He doesn't, he doesn't think of himself as a Jew living in, in, let's say, take for example, a Jew living in Westminster. Will not say, well, a Jew, I'm a Jew because I'm, I'm surrounded by Jews in Westminster and I defend the borders of the Jewish community. No, a Jew living in Westminster will say, I'm a Jew because my mother was a Jew and I don't believe in Jesus Christ. That, that's, 
That's about it. So, in, to, so the challenge in America is to get Jews to belong, to get Jews to join organizations, to belong to a synagogue, belong to a dasa, belong to the ADL, belong to the, to the, to the, to the yeah. Museum of Tolerance, belong to whatever it is. That's the challenge that we, as, as, as a collective body of Jews, need to, because that feeling, Marmara, you'll see, is very hard to pass on to the next generation. Because the next generation sees it as, you know, is there a difference? And then, you know, you slowly but surely move away. It, it means less and less to you. While a kid born to the most irreligious parents in Israel cannot move away from that milieu. You could be born in the most irreligious kibbutz. Your parents can feed you pork from day one. The fact is you're going to have the same definition. I live in Israel. I'm an Israeli by, because I'm surrounded by Jews. I defend my country. And that's what Jude Judaism is. Doesn't mean I have to keep kosher. But American Jews are not that way. American Jews are, you know, <coughs> in order to keep it going, we need to do things. We need to identify with Judaism. It's just not by osmosis as in Israel. Yeah, of course. Sure. Sure, never. They don't know. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same with all cultures. I mean, you think you think an you think an Irish guy living in South Boston defines himself as being Irish because he defends the, the yeah sure there's, there are some and they support the IRA I'm sure you know send send money but most Irish guys will tell you I'm Irish because why. And my parents are Irish. You know, my parents or grandparents or great grandparents came from Ireland. And that, I'm an Irish American, but they don't, they don't define themselves as any connection to Ireland or you know, or sort of Italians or Germans. That's 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 the way it goes. Because we live in a country here that we assimilate. The, the idea of this country was that we all live in this big melting pot and we leave everything on the outside and we all kind of surround ourselves in you know in and the middle and the middle holds. Right? The middle holds. Okay, that's also true, but that's that's basically it. I mean, you know, the Jewish Jewish history, you know, is is uh, we shouldn't we, we shouldn't fool ourselves. I mean, because what happened was is that with the rise of anti-Semitism in Western Europe, and especially in France and in Germany, the rise of anti-Semitism gave impetus to trying to solve the problem. And what are we can do with anti-Semitism? I mean, you know, we talk about the Crusades, we talk about Khmelnytsky, the pogroms. In the Middle Ages, we talk about pogroms in Russia, anti-Semitism of, of Western Europe. What are we going to do? So there was a number of different opinions of how to actually combat anti-Semitism. One was complete assimilation. Just let's convert into Christianity and forget about it. You know, we lasted long enough. It was a pretty good run. But, you know, nothing lasts forever. Even the ever-ready battery dies, the bad bunny dies sooner or later. Sooner or later right? I mean, everybody goes down. That was one approach. The other approach was to do, to get our own country. Now once that idea came out, once that idea came out to settle back to Palestine, that changed the entire face of this debate. Because now Jews have started to move to Palestine. And who was living in Palestine at this time? There you go. Arabs. And Jews started to buy off land from the Arabs. And Jews started to displace the Arabs. Now you're talking a completely different world of what we've been talking about. So as long as Jews lived under Arabs and Muslims, okay, fine, you know. Jews lived in Iraq. You know how long the Jews were living in Iraq? Till, till Saddam Hussein, thousands of years. We talked about Jews going there at the end of the, sec of the second temple era. But first temple era, they went there. Jews lived in Iran. We talk about this crazy president of Iran. It, it, the times of, 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 of Mordechai and Esther, the time of Purim, Jews had already settled in Iran. That's the 
the other half of my family. There you go, Iranian, Iranian Germans. Mazel Iraqi. Tov. Iraqi. Ah. So that's the, the problem. Okay, Iranian that's the problem. That's, that's, that's where it is. That's where it is. So you talk so you talk about so you talk about now all of a sudden Jews are talking about going back to Palestine. Okay, so a small trickle of Jews. As long as there's a small trickle of Jews, who cares? But as the movement of Zionism began to pick up steam, and people began to take it more seriously, and certainly towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when they formed the first Zionist Congress. I mean, imagine this in 1896 in Basel, Switzerland. They formed the first Zionist Congress. You think about it, it's not normal. It's absolutely not normal. And if you go to the Jewish Museum in New York, I'm not sure if they brought it here, there's a, actually a picture of the first Zionist Congress. You know, one of those old pictures that they used to have, these big, now everybody in a top hat, because Herzl made them wear a top hat, white gloves, long coat. This was a formal thing. It wasn't coming in like you're a farmer, you think you're a chassidish guy. You come in with a top hat. It was burning hot that summer in August of 1896 in the first Zionist Congress, but he didn't care Herzl. He made them all wear those coats, and he said, sweat. It's good to sweat a little bit. But you know what? That already changed, because where were Jews going to go now? To Palestine. Had they moved to New Mexico, <laughs> would have, wouldn't, wouldn't have mattered. We would never have any conflict with the Arabs. We would never, no, no, no one would have been bothered by the Arabs. And we would have had a relationship with the Arabs as we had always with, you know, some good, some bad, mostly indifferent. But we didn't. We decided we're going to go to Palestine. And the problem with the early Zionist leaders was they completely discarded the Arab problem. Completely discarded it. It's not a problem. It doesn't, who cares? We're buying off land of Arabs and we're displacing Arabs and uh, who cares? So what? This is our land, we lived here and we're just going to do what we have to do and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. They never realize that they're creating this tremendous problem that would later come back to haunt them. You know, but, but they discarded it. They just didn't want to deal with it. They thought, you know what, the Arabs will live there and we'll live here and uh, Shalom al Yisrael. There'll be peace, but that changed the whole milieu. So whatever we talked about, you know, Jews living under Muslim countries, think Morocco, think Iraq, thousands of years, hundreds of years, centuries of communities completely wiped out. 1948, from 48 to 58, probably 500,000 Moroccan Jews moved to Israel. Look, they were living there for centuries, Moroccan Jews. They moved to Israel. Iraqis were living there for centuries. They were completely, they moved to Israel. All the Jews everywhere, throughout the, all the Arab lands, there was 800,000 Svardim came to Israel to live in a very short period of time. Yemen, Yemen Jews who lived there for centuries, that changed the whole milieu because now it was, was political. Now the Jew became the enemy. Until now the Jew was, okay, a Jew living there, you know, he's living there sometimes under good stance, under, sometimes under bad stance, but now the Jew became the enemy. And that changed everything. So now in America, if you think about it, we've been talking for the past two, two, two sessions that the Jews had it much better under the Muslims. Right? They had it much better under the Muslims. Today, it's not so. Now where we live, under, we, we live here in a Christian country, it's not called a Christian country, but the vast majority of people here in this country are Christian. We live here and we live happily here. We, live, we, lived in, we live in Europe, in France, and in Germany, and in, and in, in, in London, and in, in, in Canada, and then we live, we live as, as free citizens. Where is it tough to be a Jew today? In Iran. It's tough to be a Jew in Iraq. You know how many Jews there are in Afghanistan today? One. I think there's one Jew left. The other guy died. There were two Jews living in Afghanistan. They didn't talk to each other. That's, that's, remember that story in the early times? They, didn't, they wouldn't talk to each other. Two Jews. That tells you, that sums up Jewish history. One of them died and there's one left, one Jew left in Kabul. Uh, maybe he, I think he won't go to Israel because, I, you, know, you know, he's a single guy. Because he protects the sites. There's, I think, one show left in, uh, in Kabul. And he has the keys, right? He had the keys to the Jews, <laughs> And he wouldn't give it to the other guy. Even when the other guy wanted a daven, he wouldn't give it to the other Jew. So he had the keys. So he has the keys to the shul and he's not going to leave. Because in Israel, what does he become? A nobody. In Kabul, he's the, he's the master of the keys. So he's the, you know, he's the master of the keys. So how does he, how does he, how does he get the video? He's the leader of the Jewish community. When they call the presidents of all Jewish communities, he shows up at the meetings. So how does he get a minion? There's no minion. He doesn't care. He's, he, he lives alone. He lives inside the shul. He has, he has whatever he needs there, and that's it. But Jews had, Jews had lived in Afghanistan for ages. Had lived in Afghanistan. And all, all these communities are, were, were devastated. To, to Tunisia and Libya and uh, Syria. We're talking about the Jews of Aleppo. 
and of Lebanon, cedars of Lebanon, and Jews that lived in Lebanon. And after the, after the establishment of the state of Israel in 48, they, they couldn't do it anymore because the Jew now became the enemy. The Zionists were the enemy. And that's, that's, that changed the whole political face of the world. Shoshana. I beg your pardon? There's a woman president. Now? Yeah, Liberia. 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 Do you know anything about what's going on? No. I don't know. I know Liberia was a country that was founded by freed American slaves. That's why it's called Liberia for liberation. And uh, it's been a it's been a land that's been in civil war for since since, since they founded it. The yeah, since they found it, it's been completely chaotic over there. I mean, every side, we don't know what side. Sometimes we're with the president, sometimes we're against the president, sometimes we're with the president openly, we're against the president secretly. We bump off the president, we arm the other guy, then we arm the other guy, we arm the other guy. We don't know ourselves. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy country. Charles Taylor, what? It's business as usual there. It's unfortunate because the same thing is true about the Ivory Coast, and the same thing is true about a number of those countries in around, you know, around the, the, the eastern, eastern uh, African uh, Con continent. It's just, it's sad, but I don't, there's not too many Jews there, I can tell you that much. There's, I think, one Chabad house that covers the entire Africa. I think he covers the entire Africa, Rabbi Ben Talil. I mean, he often comes to the, uh, to the Kinnis, to the regional, to the convention in New York. He gets a, he gets a standing ovation. <laughs> I don't know, this guy, he ended up in the Congo. He's in the Congo. He's in the Congo, and from the Congo, he kind of directs he directs what? The, the Republic of... Yeah, the Republic of Congo or the Democratic Republic? I'm not sure. He's somewhere in the Congo. I mean, you know what? And from there, he directs Chabad activities. He has probably the biggest land territory of any Chabadnik. <laughs> he's got, you know, he's got, he's got Uganda and Sudan and, and Nigeria and uh, Niger. And, and uh, he's got 15 countries under his domain. And what he does is in the summer... He, uh, he brings, he, he, uh, and New York uh, helps him and, and pays for this, he brings in about 100 students to Africa and they spread out throughout the African continent. So you have two students that go to Ivory Coast and two students that go here and two Bahram go there and they try to look for Jews. Excuse me, are you Jewish? You know, and they run into fellows from Crown Heights but not Jewish, you know, all of that stuff. But there, there's been satyrs there that yeah, he tries to do, because you know who comes there is Israelis. Israeli businessmen, especially Nigeria, is, Nigeria has oil, you know, and diamonds, there's a great diamond industry right. there. We're not talking about South Africa. South Africa is completely different. But everything above South Africa, north of South Africa, and south of the Muslim countries, everything in between, yeah, everything in between is just one, you know, it's not too many Jews living over there. Oh, sure, sure. Instead of, they were going to go to Tanganyika. Yeah, they were going to go to Madagascar. They, they did the Madagascar plan. But no one really wanted them. I mean, you know, they were, they were, they were themselves unsure. They, they were, the Nazis themselves were unsure of, you know, what, what are you going to do with this? Especially after 39. See, in Germany itself, they ended up with a half a million Jews, which is not, which is not much compared to the three million that they were going to inherit right after the war in Poland. So they themselves weren't sure what they want to do with the Jews. I mean, Hitler wanted them out, that's for sure. But I think in the early part of it, he wanted to, you know, to suppress them. They all leave, get out, you know, who needs them? You know, you know, get out of it. Then they, then they formed what they called the government central. They set up cent centers throughout Europe that they were going to settle them in, but no one wanted them. You can't bus a million Jews from, from Poland into somewhere into France. France doesn't want them. You think we want them? Well, how are you going to get them to Madagascar? You think Madagascar wants six million Jews? So they abolished that plan pretty quickly. Now, had that come to fruition, it would have been a very different. The, the British discussed uh, this extensively. Right. The House of Lords, yeah. And uh, one of the options was to send them to Guyana. Yeah. With in, internal politics. Yeah, it inter interfered with, his, with the original plans to send the Jews to Africa. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he was kind of a conspiracy, but someone from the outside. 
Who's gonna? Who's gonna? Who's meddling? Who's meddling? Well, you always, you always, of course, of course. That was always that was always his argument. Was always you know you can't meddle. I mean, and that was Roosevelt's argument too. Is why does he do? Why, why doesn't he do more? He said this is an internal, it's an internal situation. I mean, what's he? What, you know, what's he going to do until? And, uh, I mean, you know what? No, we had a terrible anti-Semitic State Department. I mean, they could they could care less. I mean, they were they 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 didn't shed a tear for you know for the Holocaust. And that, yeah, sure, sure, all those guys. I mean, and same thing was true about Britain. I mean, Britain after the war did Churchill the biggest favor after he won the war for them. They booted him out, right? And they put in they put in they put in uh, Attlee Atlee and, uh, and a socialist and an anti-Semite and uh, this was uh, yeah, listen. I mean. The history of anti-Semitism is a lecture for, for another day and another time because it's you know it's worth discussing. I mean I th you know think about this, but uh, but basically uh, I think we have enough enough to we we, we discussed enough tonight. Yeah. All right, okay. Thank you.